Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Psalms in the Bible. This is lesson number three in that series for January 20 of 2024, entitled, The Lord Reigns. Is there any question about that? Well, let's see. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we have gathered here once again to discuss these issues, to learn something more about what the psalmist thought, what they said, what they wrote down so many, many years ago. Help us to understand their situation and how it might apply to our situation is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmists, and we've already discovered that there are a lot of different psalmists. They're not all so many people think that David must have written all the Psalms. That certainly is not true. Uh, a number of the Psalms were written in the days of David. But anyway, the psalmist recognize that God created us and therefore knows what is best for us. You know, you, see, you think the person who made it should know the most about it, probably, right? His requirements are not restrictions on our liberty, and this is a very important point but rather they are protections from the dangers of committing sin. As creator, God is also the sovereign king of the entire universe. He rules with fairness and justice, keeping his rules brings happiness and health. Thus, God is the originator of every, every absolute in our world. He will bring every man and woman into judgment, every man and woman into judgment in his time, not ours, rewarding the righteous as well as punishing the wicked. It is only in observing his rules for life that we are safe and secure for eternity. God's rules are actually protections for those who abide by them. <coughs> Excuse me. Throughout the Psalms, we see evidence that they believed firmly that God was our creator. See, especially Psalm 8 and Psalm 100. And, and it's mentioned so many times in the Psalms all through the book. In Psalm 8, David recognized that God created everything in our entire universe. Uh, earth and heavens, sun, moon, and stars. And then he wondered why God should pay any attention to us as small and insignificant as we are. We must appear in the vastness of our universe. But then he recognized that even the smallest birds are protected and cared for. Not even one bird falls without God knowing. And you know, of course, that's quoting who? That's quoting Jesus himself, isn't it? On the basis of this knowledge, we can rejoice that God wants to be our friend. And we'll get to some more details on John 15, 15 in a moment. Jim, from our Bible study guide. In this lesson, we shall examine five aspects of God's sovereignty in the Psalter. We will see that the Psalms affirm the following. The foundation of God's sovereignty is based in the creation. The Lord is the maker of the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1, and humanity, Genesis 1.26. On the basis of this Bible truth, the various psalmists proclaim that Yahweh is the ruler over all the world and the nations. The sovereignty of the Lord is inseparably intertwined in his work as judge. As judge, God intercedes for his people because of his covenant with them. He is faithful to the rules of the, his treaty because the law of his covenant is the foundation of his kingdom from the Bible study guide. So the question there is, the person who created us, does he know the best way for us to work? Does he know the best way for our bodies to function? That's why he gave a prescription. That's the question. Well, these are very familiar verses, but we should read them maybe one time again. Dwayne? Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, when God created the universe, American Bible Society, 1992, the Holy Bible, oh, what, what am I going to read here, Dr. Hart? Number, the next one, Genesis Okay, one. okay, here we go. Genesis 1-26. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all the animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So let's think about God as creator for a few moments. Gordon? From the Bible study guide, we cannot overlook the importance of the creation in the teachings of the scriptures. 
Isaiah uses the argument of God as creator to annihilate the validity of a belief in idols. Let me interrupt for a second. You see it mentions there Isaiah 40. Isaiah goes on for four chapters and then some more, even after that a bit. And he just, <laughs> what he says about, about idols almost makes you laugh. It's just completely ridiculous. Go ahead. Similarly, the psalmist uses the same reasoning to recognize Yahweh as sovereign of heaven and to reject idolatry. And there's several references from Psalms. The foundation of God's kingdom is creation. That foundation should be the reason for our worship of him. The creation is also the reason for the Sabbath and it gives uh, Genesis 2 and Exodus 20. And the seventh day is a remembrance of the power of God. With this background, we better understand why the message of Revelation 14, 7 states, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And I've heard rumors somewhere that that's the message we're supposed to be spreading to the word, right? To the entire world? That's what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. While other ancient nations believed that the forces of nature, such as the sun and the moon and the seasons were godlike, the Bible clearly teaches us that God controls all those forces and objects. Psalms 29, Psalms 93, Psalms 104, just as examples. Myra? The Bible study guide says, creation also testifies to God's love. Everything that exists owes its existence to God, who also sustains life. Notice that God not only granted people existence, but he also made ancient Israel his people and the sheep of his pasture, Psalms 100. So that means there's some, some people are special, more special than others? Oh, it sounds that way. <laughs> sounds that way, doesn't it? Okay, go ahead. The notion of his people, in quotes, and his sheep reveals God's desire for a close relationship with his people. It's from the... In, Bible study guide for Sunday, January 14th. Okay, is there anybody that God doesn't want to have a relationship with? No. No. Those who continually reject him, he will allow to leave, but he wants yes. a relationship with everyone. Okay, so the, now our verse, John 15, 15. I, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples on the last night he was with them, okay, in the upper room. I do not call you servants any longer because servants, and the word really is the word for slaves, because servants or slaves do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I've heard from my father. That He's saying- That doesn't talk about a hierarchy, does it? No. Or record keeping. No, no hierarchy here. Okay, Jim, Bible study guide again. Only the Creator has the power to bless and cause His people to increase, and thus He is the only one worthy of their worship and trust. Numerous Psalms call everything that has breath, all, excuse me, all the earth, the sea, and everything in it, shout for joy before the Lord from the Bible study guide. And we would say not just on this world, but wherever else, Holy the entire universe, right? Because God created us and sustains us every minute, then he is also our sovereign Lord. And there's four references in Psalms. It says that same thing in Acts 17 when Paul was trying to preach to the Athenians. You know, because God loves every one of his children, and how many of us are his children? Every one of us. Uh, every one of us. And he also recognizes the damage that sin does to them. Therefore, quote he, loves those who hate evil. Does that make sense? Do you love people who are destroying your children? Wow. Simple question, right? <laughs> so, and he said that to the, he said that the righteous should be glad and rejoice because of what the Lord has done. And that's, of course, Psalms 97. Think about now, we've talked about God as greater. What about God as king? Dwayne? God made the universe, therefore it belongs to him. Thus, he is its king. The Lord reigns, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. 
Psalm 93. Well, Psalms 97 goes on, summarizing well the message of God's kingship. God reigns, Psalms 97, 1. Many Psalms exalt God as king. Psalm 47, 93, 95 to 99. And I mean, if you start making statements like this, the Psalms just, you know, I spent a lot of time on these lessons on Psalms because what do you do if there's almost every comment here, there's five, 10, 15, 20 references. You can't put them all in. Anyway, dramatic elements, number two, dramatic elements such as clouds, darkness, fire, lightning, the earth, mountains, and the, mount and the heavens surround God. So what do, we, what do you mean by when we say it surround God? These are pictures that are used to describe visions that people saw of God, right? These meteorological phenomena and geological Splendors portray the greatness of the King of Heaven, the kings, who inspires our, our awe and reverence. Now, I'm, those of you who come to some of my other classes, remember that I have said, the way you can tell when the actual Messiah shows up the second time is how? The heavens Heaven will be full of the angels. The entire sky will be full of bright, shining angels. Satan will not be able and will not be allowed by God to duplicate that kind of coming. So if you want to know if it's the real Messiah who's making claims, look up. You can know the answer. Three, the shamefulness of idolatry is condemned in contrast to the superiority of worship. And we've already mentioned, of worshiping God, we've already mentioned the craziness of idolatry is mentioned in Isaiah 40 and following. God's children praise Him and rejoice in the righteous, righteous judgments of His government. More verses. Five, love for God inspires believers to hate evil, Psalm 97.10. The Lord preserves and delivers his people from the hand of the wicked. These reasons are grounds enough to rejoice and give thanks to him. 97.1 and, and following. The Gordon. Lord is king. Earth be glad. Rejoice, you islands of the seas, from Good News Bible. Want to do the Bible study guide there with it? And it, the Bible study guide says, the Lord's rule is demonstrated in his works of creation, salvation, and judgment. And it has references for each. The Lord establishes his kingship over the whole world. Again, references. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, unparalleled in power and majesty. Several references. The Lord's reign is established on mercy justice and righteousness, and it brings order and stability to the created world. References. God, God's reign unites both heavenly and earthly worshipers in the praise of God. Several references. Many Psalms envision all humanity acknowledging God's sovereign rule. Several uh, references. Okay. So you know what I'm going to ask about that. When is that going to happen? All humanity Acknowledging God's sovereign rule? At the third coming. At the third coming, yeah. Okay, Psalms... It hasn't happened yet. No. Myra, you want to take on Psalm 93 there? 93, verses 1 and 2. The Lord is king. He is clothed with majesty and strength. The earth is set firmly in place and cannot be moved. Your th throne, O Lord, has been firm from the beginning and you existed before time began. Okay, next question. Would astronomers agree with the statement, the Earth is set firmly in place, cannot be moved? I, I think Probably. they would say it's flying through the universe rapidly. It's but it, but it's, it's, it's controlled by firm rules. We know about the rules of gravitation. As a result of his creative ability and continued care for us, Psalm 148 says that all objects and all creatures, all objects and all creatures in the entire universe should continuously, continuously praise the Lord. I mean, what do children say about their father if they love him? However, we recognize that not everyone accepts the sovereignty of God. The wicked do almost everything one, can ima one could imagine to defy God's rulership. 
they deny and mock the Lord while oppressing his people. But God's faithful people know that God will win the great controversy in the end. There is no doubt about that final result. It is only fools that do not recognize these truths. Gordon, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Jim. Psalm 14. Psalms 14, 1. Fools say to themselves, there is no God. They are all corrupt, and they have done terrible things. There is no one who does what is right. Good news, Bible. Does that remind you of a verse in the New Testament? Quoting that verse, Psalm 3, I'm saying it's Psalm 3, Romans 3. Because of their rebellion against God, the ancient Jewish people were often conquered by their neighboring nations. At times they feared that all would be lost or destroyed, even their sacred temple and objects of worship. Did that happen? Yes. Who destroyed the temple and all of its sacred objects? Either destroyed it or took it. Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar. At finally, such, finally the third time he came. Yeah. At such times they cried out. Okay, Dwayne. Psalm, 90, uh, Psalm 74, 10 and 22. Oh, oh, how long, oh God, will our enemies laugh at you? Will they insult your name forever? Rouse yourself, God, and defend your cause. Remember that godless people laugh at you all day long. Okay, so God is a real problem. He's trying to work with people who should be but behaving and, and, and listening and paying attention, and they're not, and they're misbehaving in any way they can possible, possibly misbehave, and God has to deal with them at the same time. If he punishes them or if he, he, he steps away from them, then the even more wicked people come in. What do you do? You want to go ahead with 73 there? Then... When I was in your temple, I understood what will happen to the wicked. You will put them in slippery places and make them fall to destruction. They are instantly destroyed. They go down to a horrible end. They are like a dream that goes away in the morning. When you arouse yourself, O oh Lord, they disappear. Okay. So, when I read this kind of stuff, I say, okay, where did that come from? Was this information, I mean, he sounded like, he, that sounds like something that we would say belongs to the third coming, right? Wicked people will disappear? A dream that goes away in the morning? Hmm. What? Or is David or somebody else here saying, well, wait till I get my sword ready and I'll take care of him? I mean, is that what he really thinks? Okay, well, these ideas are repeated in the New Testament, even in the words of Jesus. And let me just quote a couple of those. You, these are ones that are familiar. So if one group is fighting against another in Satan's kingdom, remember this is after they had accused Jesus of casting out demons because, of, because he's the chief of demons. He's controlled by the demons. This means that it is already divided into groups and will soon fall apart. You say that I drive out demons because Beelzebub, Beelzebul, I'm sorry, gives me the power to do so. Well, then, who gives your followers the power to drive them out? What your own followers do proves that you're wrong. No, it is not Beelzebul, but God's Spirit who gives me the power to drive out demons, which proves that the kingdom of God has already come upon you. And what did he mean when he said the, the kingdom of God has already come upon you? Here I am, right? Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, repeating the same idea. Do we understand the issues in the great controversy well enough to know that we should hate evil because of what it does to us? Do we love evil or do we hate evil? Many of us <laughs> Everybody, everybody's so rushing, ready to run. I maintain everybody has to be exposed to evil so that they can learn to reject it. How much exposure does it take? An immunization okay. dose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be nice if it were possible. Yeah. Well, okay. The next category we need to think about is God as judge. So we've had God as creator. We've had God as king. 
we have God as judge. And in the, to the people who are writing these Psalms, when they, when, if you said God is judge, what were they thinking about? Do you remember how the judicial system worked in those days? Let's, let's take the instructions that Moses gave to people in his day. What did they say? There were rulers over ten. If you can't figure out what, if they can't, the ruler over ten can't figure it out, it goes to the ruler over fifty. If they can't figure it out, it goes up the ladder. And for things that none of them could figure out, where did it go? Went to Moses. And then later, it went to the king. So that was the way the judge system worked. So you had people who were in executive power, I mean, like the kings would be responsible. Moses, look at how much he was responsible for. And then when a, a serious case came along, of course, Moses usually consulted with God, but he would be the final, the final judge. So we, they were accustomed to the idea that kings would be judges. That's my point, okay? King Where was, are we? King was the Supreme Court. Yeah. Or yet Moses the was the Supreme Court. In the New Testament, it got, Jesus says, I don't judge no one. It's the words I have spoken will be your judge. Mm -hmm. and, but here, all everything is all like, a, it's designed like a code book or a, a hammer to, to keep, in an attempt to keep people in line is the way this, this stuff is written. Not, Jesus never talked like this. <clears throat> well, well, we'll see about that. That one's one of the questions, okay? From the Bible study guide, the Lord is judge because he is king. In ancient Israel, the monarch rendered the verdict in trials and judicial matters, such as David and Solomon and references given. Thus, the, king, the idea of a king judge was a familiar notion to the people in those days. When they listened to the psalmists sing their melodies about the Lord as judge, they readily grasped the concept. concept in the teacher's Bible study guide. Okay. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? The purpose of God's judgment is to rid the universe of evil so that the righteous can live safely throughout eternity. Do we all agree with that? Anything wrong with that? But if they're going to live throughout eternity because evil has been eliminated, but how is it eliminated? Through force? Oh, or no. by people that become persuaded that that's the way, way to, to live. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to eliminate those who aren't willing to, 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 to do that. So there's a certain amount of force, I you guess. Keep, you would, keep a certain people, uh, keep people in a certain level of uh, fear and, and intimidation and coercion? No, you just eliminate them. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> Well, why didn't you do it? Uh, why did we? Why has it taken so long? If that's the case, uh, because it takes a long time for us to make up our minds and realize he can't take to heaven anyone who's not safe to take there. So he's given you as long as you need to figure that out. In ancient times, it was common <clears throat> for a king to be the ultimate judge of a matter. Think of the cases which were brought to Solomon very famous. His wisdom was demonstrated by the giving of a right judgment. And if you go back and look at the records, because I did that fairly recently, people were coming even to Solomon from countries far away to get his judgments on difficult cases. Hmm. And no matter how much the wicked seem to prosper, eventually we know what will come of their efforts. Psalm 75, verses 8 to 10. The Lord holds his cup in his hand, filled with the strong wine of his anger. He pours it out, and all the wicked drink it. They drink it down to the last drop. But I will never stop speaking of God, of the God of Jacob, or singing praises to him. He, he will break the power of the wicked, but the power of the righteous will be increased. Okay, that sounds like pretty forceful language. Um. So we can be assured that every person who has ever lived will be brought before the righteous judgment of God in the end and that all will be judged fairly. And there's, we'll talk more about the idea in just a moment. That idea is reflected in the third angel's message in Revelation 14.10. Um, whoever worships the beast and its image 
will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured out at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. Now we know how that has been understood many times. We realize that there's another way to interpret that. Uh, we realize that this is God's anger is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway. And of course, we should talk about the fire. What is the fire that we're talking about there? God's glory. God's glory. We're going to see some more about that in just a moment. It's life to the righteous and death to the wicked. Yep. The same God, fire. God's justice ultimately comes when he makes a final judgment of all beings just before his second coming. Psalm 96 and 13. Um, Jim? When the Lord comes to rule the earth, he will rule the peoples of the world with justice and fairness from the Goodness Bible. And that's what we want, right? Justice and fairness. The judgment is described quite distinctly in the following two passages. Dwayne? Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Let me interrupt for just a second. Now, who is this Joshua that he's talking about here? It's the high priest. It's certainly not Joshua of Caleb and Joshua. No, or Moses Moses, with Moses. Back. Yeah. This is thousands of... Hundreds of years later. Well, a thousand years later. Uh, this is a Joshua who was the high priest that came back from Babylonian captivity back to the land of Israel um, after the Babylonian captivity. Very different. So the first Joshua came from Egypt to Palestine, and this Joshua came from Babylon to Palestine. Go ahead. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Okay, so that's the individual. That's what's going on in central stage in the judgment. Okay, what else is going on? Gordon? Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. Do we have to ask a question about who has been living forever? Only God has been living forever, right? Mm -hmm. okay. his, his throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. Good News Bible. Okay, would you describe these people as the jury? Sounds that yes way. Yes or no? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. The jury, a little different than the juries we have today, but yeah. We need to recognize that God's purpose in the so-called investigative judgment is not, I emphasize not, so that he can learn something he does not already know. He immediately, if you say that, you're saying God is not omniscient. This judgment is for the benefit of the onlooking universe. Myra? From the writings of Mrs. White, could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven and witness the high and holy state of perfection that ever exists there? Every soul filled with love, every countenance beaming with joy, enrapturing music and melodious strains, rising in honor of God and the Lamb, and ceaseless streams of light flowing into the redeeming upon on the, the redeeming face of him who sitteth on the throne. Could those whose hearts 
are filled with hatred of God, of truth and holiness mingle with the heavenly throng and join their songs of praise? Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No. No, the years of probation were granted them, that they might form characters for heaven, but they have never trained the mind to love purity, they have never learned the language of heaven, and now it is too late. The life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture for them. What? Its purity, holiness, and peace would be what for them? Torture. So is God arbitrarily leaving the sinners out of heaven? Well, would you like to go to heaven? Suggest and be that he's mercifully leaving yeah. them yeah. <laughs> yeah. out. Yeah, I mean... Heaven is self-selected. If you don't want to live there, you're not going to... Yeah. Have... So, and, so this, is, that's the, this is the basis for that. It would be... It would, I mean, it would be hell for them if they went to heaven. That's right. Okay, go ahead. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to, be, long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed on their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. And that's from Great Controversy, pages 542 to 543. God will not be responsible for the eternal torment of any individual. If he took to heaven, took them to heaven to keep them there eternally, that would be what? That would be eternal torment, right? Be in prison for the... Eternal. Even the devil will receive his just reward. Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sins. Great God, verse 670. So Satan and all his evil followers, down to the last one, are being left out of heaven. Why? Because taking them to heaven would be torture. Okay? Would you want a loving God to torture somebody for eternity? No. There's absolutely no danger that anyone will be treated unfairly in God's final judgment. The final results are seen in Romans 6.23. Jim? For sin pays its wage, death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord, Goodness Bible. So each side has its wages, right? So how does God's judgment actually take place? For a detailed description, it's great to read Great Controversy, page 662 to 678, which of course we can't read here, right here. <laughs> it would take a long time. But here's a sort of a summary. Dwayne? First, God delivers his people from the wicked and crowns the humble with salvation. Second, the unrepentant wicked are destroyed forever. Some Psalms poetically describe the usefulness, uselessness of human weapons against the divine judge. The Lord is also a forgiving God, although he punishes people's misdeeds. God's people, not only the wicked, shall give an account to God. Okay. So what does God do with the righteous people? He rewards them. What does God do with the wicked people? He lets them go. You can describe that in whatever terms you want. It's destruction for them. So Psalm 97 verse 3, a very brief description. Gordon? Fire goes in front of him and burns up his enemies around him. Good news Bible. Okay, now the question I have for you is, did the psalmist see that in vision? Where did he get that idea? Don't everybody talk at once. I was going to let Gordon answer that one. 
Thank you, dear. <laughs> well, I, I think that the psalmist did see visions of, that God yeah. gave him, that God gave each of them. Okay, you want to pick up with the Bible study guide there? From the Bible study guide, the Psalms convey the same notion that is expressed in other biblical texts, that God's judgment begins with God's people and is extended to the whole earth. The psalmist cries to God to judge him, but relies on God's righteousness to defend him. Okay, so... Judge huh? me, but defend me. Yeah. So how many people are going to be judged in the final judgment? Everyone. Everyone who has ever lived, starting from Adam, everyone who has ever lived uh, that, that has had an opportunity to make a choice, I guess some people who were born incapable of making decisions, maybe not. First Peter 4, 17, Myra. The time has come for judgment to begin and God's own people are the first to be judged. If it starts with us, how will it end with those who do not believe the good news from God? And that process is described in a little more detail in Ezekiel 9, 4 to 6. Many people fear even the idea of judgment. In our system of judgment here in the United States, we are only called to court to be condemned if the evidence demands. Isn't that the way it works here? Supposedly. But in the heavenly court, the righteous are rewarded before the wicked are condemned. Do, how often do we get called to court to be rewarded? I, I see people have. smiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never have. You've never been there, huh? Not for that purpose. Okay, Psalm 67, verse 4. May the nations be glad and sing for joy because you, you judge the peoples with justice and guide every nation on our earth. And you can compare Psalms 98 as well. The Bible study guide goes on to add, the theme of God's judgment prompts a significant question. How can God's people have peace with God and assurance of salvation at the time of judgment? And a number of references are given there. So, how can you be sure? If you know that God is going to reward the righteous and he's going to punish the wicked, how would you, what would you need to do to make sure that you're going to survive this judge? You need to be on the righteous side, right? I don't think there's any other choice. But God's people are secure because the Lord places his dwelling place in Zion and establishes everlasting covenant with them as his treasured possession. Okay, so in other words, he's, she's using the, the psalmist, whoever there is using a, a, a symbol that they were familiar with. Ultimately, the judge, the dealing with sin and everything happened at the temple in the courtyard. So Psalm 103, verse 3, Jim. If he forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases, good news Bible. Okay, now let's talk about that for just a moment. What do we mean when we say he forgives all my sins? Is there a big ledger up there with a gazillion things written in it and God comes along and smudges out something that's been forgiven? No. No, I, God simply, Hebrews 11, I'm sorry, Hebrews 10, uh, the last three or four verses in Hebrews 10, he chooses not to remember these things. He's omniscient. He's, he knows everything. And we'll see some more of that coming up here shortly. But God, his forgiveness says, that doesn't matter anymore. These are my children. I love them. They're doing what I want them to do. I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about their past sins. So as, as one friend said, God will say, I distinctly remember forgetting that. Mm -hmm forgetting or not holding it against you. I remember. Yeah, I distinctly remember not remembering <laughs> something like that. Okay, Psalms 105. Who is that? Jim still. Jim? Psalm 105, as a whole, shows the Lord's faithfulness to his covenant in Israel's history. And everything that happened, the good and the bad, God was there. He providentially led Joseph to Egypt and through him saved his people and the nations in that area during the severe famine. 
the Lord raised Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, Egyptian slavery, which he did with signs and wonders on their behalf. And, and I, also, right. I would like to add to that bit of wisdom right there, something that I discovered a while back that really just blows me away. When Abraham went down to Egypt, he was a very wealthy man with a beautiful wife. And what happened? Pharaoh wanted his wife. And Abraham realized that was going to happen, a good chance it would happen. And he says, you got to tell, her, tell Pharaoh that you're my sister, which was half truth. And then, of course, you know what happened. Sarah, Pharaoh figured out that the, Abraham was really her husband and he was going to do some things. And then he realized that God started pouring troubles on him. And so he made a decree because of Abraham's sin there. He made a decree that Egyptians shouldn't have anything to do with shepherds. And lo and behold, that ends up being the law which preserved the children of Israel when they went down to Egypt three generations or whatever generations later, kept them separate. So they, had, they were able to develop into a separate nation instead of just fading into, just melting into Egyptian society. Amazing. Yeah. Many people fear even the idea of judgment. In our system of justice, we already look at that. Um, Anyway, the righteous are rewarded before the wicked are condemned in God's system. So now think about the God of covenant. What does covenant mean? Oh, begin this, within this context, Yahweh is depicted as a warrior in the Psalter. Psalm 7 is a prayer before battle in which the psalmist asks for God's intervention in favor of his people. The psalmist also claims God's protection and ask for the destruction of God's enemies. God is the psalmist's defense, evoking either the idea of a castle or a shield. God, the divine warrior, is portrayed as wearing a sword, a bow, and arrows, instruments of death. He has prepared a trap for his enemies. Wow. What do we do with that kind of language? Put it, put it together with statements about how wonderful God is, how, what a God of love and mercy and compassion He is, and come to a synthesis of all those ideas. Okay. So let's talk about that. What was or is God's overall plan for the children of Israel and for us? From the Bible Study Guide, in this covenant, Israel's primary calling is to remain faithful to the covenant by observing God's laws. God's people are also, God's people also are called to bear witness about God to other nations because the, the Lord wishes all nations to join his people, Israel. Okay, how well did they do at that? Well, no. <laughs> they didn't even I mean, themselves, I mean, let alone convert the, their, their neighbors. We've, we've talked about the fact that Abraham had as a part of his household a thousand souls. Many of the people recently converted from heathenism. And they came and they joined his, they were attracted to him because of all kinds of things. But they, and they liked working for him. And they learned about God from him. How many of Abraham's followers managed to do that? How well did his nephew Lot do? <laughs> nope. No, not at all. Okay. Um, Psalm 89, 28 to 34. I will always keep my promise to him and my covenant with him will last forever. His dynasty will be as permanent as the sky. A de descendant of his will always will be, a descendant of his will always be king. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second again. Was there something special about David's DNA? No, I don't Is think Is that so. an impossible question? Why did God say to David, he's still a young man, yeah. Your DNA is going to be inherited by my divine son. 
We also got the Moabites in there too. Yeah, well, uh, lots of Jer other stuff. Jericho, there. And, so, and, I mean, <laughs> and the Canaanites, I yeah, mean. Uh, sure. But the question is, I mean, he didn't say that to the Moabites. He didn't say that to the Canaanites, even though their DNA got mixed in there somewhere. He said that to David. And I, I've struggled with that question. Um, obviously, David's descendants reigned in the land of Judah for years and years and years. Did that make them... Because we here in this country are sort of looked down our noses at the divine right of kings kind of thing. Um, is there something special about kings? I guess that's really what we're asking, isn't it? There is about the king of heaven. Yes. I think that one's a little different. No. <laughs> that was my point. Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Uh, verse 30. But if his descendants disobey my law and do not live according to my commands, if they disregard my instructions and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish them for their sins. I will make them suffer for their wrongs. Now, that, mean, that kind of sounds like David's descendants are going to be treated the same as all the rest of us, right? Okay, go ahead. Um, but I will not stop loving David or fail to keep my promise to him. I will not break my covenant with him or take back even one promise I made him. Wow. So where does that place Gentile Christians? Could we be a part of God's overall plan? I love these verses. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. It is through faith that all of you are God's children. It doesn't say DNA, does it? Faith. In union with Christ Jesus. You are baptized into union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So, there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You're all one in union with Christ Jesus. Do you know what's significant about that particular expression? Paul was raised as a Pharisee a male Pharisee. And the male Pharisee pray, prayer said what? Got up in the morning, Lord, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile, a slave, or especially a woman. In that order. Yeah. And so now what's Paul saying? <laughs> there's, there's no difference. I mean, what a change. So then you, if you belong to Christ, then you're all the descendants of Abraham, all descendants of Abraham and we'll receive what God has promised. So the DNA thing has kind of gone out the window, right? When do you think Paul came to that conclusion? And were those lightning bolt moments? That I was part of his three years of study after the lightning bolts. Yeah. yeah, possibly. Probably, yeah, most likely. Okay, um, the Lord's supremacy, I guess, Jim, this is yours. The Lord's supremacy in the world as the sovereign creator, king, and judge has theological implications for the rea reliability of his testimonies. God's laws are unchangeable and indestructible, from the Bible study guide. Okay, and so lots of these things raise questions. I hope they raise questions in your mind. Are these laws unchangeable and indestructible just because God said it, and so help me, it's going to be that way? Or is it they're like that because God made the very best rules that could be made, and they're the right ways to live? Well, you can defy gravity if you want, but... <laughs> try, just that, try. Gravity, though, is really a law. The yeah. rest of these are prescriptions or descriptions of the way people that will live, or intelligent creatures will live for eternity if they follow the prescription. So, g g these laws, choose to call them what you want, God's laws or whatever, they are, they are the only way to run a universe, in my opinion. I think that's the description. They are the only way to run. If you start changing them, you're going to run into trouble. Or, de or de you know, denying or defying them. Is there any, ever any reason to doubt God's promises? Those who love your law 
have perfect security, and there is nothing that can make them fail, or make them fall. There you go. You want to take on the next few verses there? Instead, they find joy in obeying the law of the Lord, and they study it day and night. They are like trees that grow beside a stream, that bear fruit at the right time, and whose leaves do not dry up. They succeed in everything they do. And that's a few verses from the famous first psalm. Have you ever suffered because you kept God's law? Well, those days are coming, aren't they? The devil will do everything he can do to destroy or confuse God's people in the final days. From the Bible study guide, this study focuses on some key descriptions of God and his activities, which establish the world and render it firm and secure. The psalmist's appeal to God, who is the creator, king, judge, covenantal savior, and lawgiver. Okay. The, the roles in the world that God occupies are further reflected in God's various other names and titles, including shepherd, rock of salvation, the father, in the world and the father in the world we can be secure and safe even amid the toil of the great controversy turmoil turmoil of the great controversy because god is sovereign and faithful in all that he does and says although these theological themes are by no means exhaustive they are suggestive of the ways god of the various ways in which god reveals himself in the psalms as we continue to study the Psalms, it is important to remember to read the Psalms in light of God's character of love and grace and his plan to save and restore the world. The more we study the divine character in the light of the cross, this is from Ellen White, by the way, this starting now, the more we see mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness blended with equity and justice, and the more clearly we discern innumerable evidences of a love that is infinite and a tender pity surpassing a mother's yearning sympathy for her wayward child, Ellen White from Steps to Christ. Wow. Then back to the Bible study guide. In the Psalms, even when the people face God's judgment for their rebellion, they continue to call upon God because they know that God's anger is only for a time, but his mercy is everlasting. Is his okay. anger really for a time? That's... That's what the Bible study guide says. And in fact, those, those are words right out of the Psalms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Myra? From the Bible study guide, why is understanding the reality and the prevalence of the great controversy crucial in helping us understand that despite God's ultimate rulership and sovereignty, there is still much turmoil and suffering in our world? Why is the great controversy great controversy motive so helpful to us. Yeah. How should the belief in God as creator shape our understanding of ourselves, our relationship with the rest of creation? What happens when people stray from the truth? Psalms 106. Okay, if there's one path to salvation and we choose to wander off the path, what happens? We don't arrive at, you know, who, who was it that said, you know, I may you be... You may get to the bottom of the hill, but you won't be in the same shape as you would be if you'd right. gone on the path. Yeah. The famous words, if you turn off on the wrong trail, you may be as sincere as possible, but you're going you're gonna to arrive at the wrong destination, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens when we get too friendly with the world and begin to adopt their ways? Psalm 106, 35 to 42. But they, that is Israel, it was talking about at that time, intermarried with them, these, the, that is the heathen around them, and adopted their pagan ways. God's people worshipped idols, and this caused their destruction. Is this, it made God angry and he destroyed them, or what? How did worshipping these idols cause their destruction? He let them have their way. Yeah. And their ways destroyed themselves. Okay, well, the next verse says, So the Lord was angry with his people. He was disgusted with them. He abandoned them to the power of the heathen 
and their enemies ruled over them. So they were, they were destroyed by their enemies' swords because God couldn't protect them anymore. They were oppressed by their enemies and were in complete subjection to them. Okay. Was God angry or is it sad that they chose not to listen? Well, we would like to, we would prefer to say sad, but the Bible language says angry. What was wrong with the idols of the nations in biblical times? Well, let's, I think we have time to look at that really quick. Their gods are made of silver and gold formed by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell, they have hands but cannot feel, and feet but cannot walk. They cannot make a sound. <laughs> May all who made them and who trusted in them become like the idols they have made. I, I have to chuckle when I read that. Okay, you want to be dumb and <laughs> you know, can't even make a sound? Okay, just follow the idols. Anyway, what about modern idols? Do we have, uh -oh. we don't have idols, right? Now you've gone to meddling. Hmm. Why are they just as dangerous to our walk with the Lord? Well. They're the same as the gods of, the pagan gods of biblical times. Okay, Jim? The present age is one of idolatry as was that in which Elijah lived. No outward shrine may be visible. There may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet thousands are following the gods of this world after riches, fame, pleasure, and the pleasing fables that permit man to follow the inclinations of the regenerate heart. Multitudes have wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly false, serving a false God as were the worshipers of Baal. Wow. Many even of those who claim to be Christians have allied themselves with influences that are in, unalterably opposed to God and his truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Ellen White, Prophets of Kings, page 177. You dare go to your neighbor and say, because you have a false picture of God, you're worshiping idols? <laughs> That's the question we're left with. Think about it for yourself. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have just read some pretty astounding words. Idols in the 21st century? Is that really possible? And how do those idols affect us? Help us, Lord, to be wide awake to see clearly where things are leading us and our friends around us help us to witness to others that they may set aside these idols is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen.